we get started? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome Brock Palin uh, from Kane Advanced Computing. He's going to be talking to us about Visit and as well as some other things. So without further ado, let Brock take it away. Okay, so uh, I'm Brock Palin. I'm one of the admins at uh, the CAC. And um, I'm going to give a quick rundown of the CAC. The CAC is located in the College of Engineering. Um, but that shouldn't scare away anybody from the College of Engineering, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, we operate two primary systems. One that's an old system that we run for the College of Engineering. Another one is a new one that we operate for the Office of the Vice President for Research Computing Cyber Infrastructure, otherwise known as Flux. Is anybody using Flux in here? Anybody heard of Flux before? Okay, well that's good. Some of you have. Um, Flux is interesting. Flux is a high-performance computing cluster. It's built out of nodes currently that have 12 cores, 48 gigs of RAM per node, and we've got about 4,000 cores. We have 2,000 more on the way. Um, so that adds up to a couple of terabytes of RAM, everything else. We also provide other things. We have a complete software stack. Uh, we also have, like, it's an example of our disk system here, which talking about massive quantities of data and extracting information from massive quantities of data is going to be the focus of this entire thing. Massive data sets, like next generation, we call like exascale problems, only can live on systems like this. This is um, the storage system that sits behind Flux. It can currently um, ingest and ingest data at about five gigabytes per second, and I'll let the person sleep. So to give you an idea what that is, like a regular audio CD is about 0.6 gigabytes. So I can write, what's that, 10, 10 CDs a second, roughly? And actually, um, the limitation is actually the number of disks we have. If we have more disks, this whole system can actually go to about 15 gigabytes a second. Um, and we can actually, with the software we're using, we can stack these side by side. And we can actually just keep increasing performance and capacity just by installing more of these things. Point is, this is very common. Um, I'm going to be on a system for doing the demo today. Not specifically Flux, we're going to be using one at the National Institutes of Computational Science, where they actually have several of these stack together and can move data at an absolutely massive rate. So the first tool I'm actually going to mention is something called um, Globus Online. Has anybody here ever used Griff, TP, or Globus? Does anybody here have to deal with data sets measuring into terabytes? Really? Wrong room. Um, where we come from in the high performance computing world we generally have to move around large files. This is going to be the example data set I'm using. This was uh, generated by a faculty in atmospheric oceanic space framework. So this is just a regular code for weather prediction and other things. You'll notice the files though, uh, they're 200 gig a piece. What this Globus tool lets me do is we have a Globus server on our end. NICS has a Globus server on there, and in pretty much any of these large national resources we can get you access to, exceed DOE, you know, local resources have a Globus server. And Globus does a number of things to move files faster. Basically what I can do is I can say, hey, I want to move these files to our local cluster, and I say move, and it emails me when it's done. I don't, it never travels through my laptop. I never, it never has to go through that little pipe that comes into my office. It can stay on Internet 2. Anybody here familiar with Internet 2 or National Lambda Rail, these high performance multiple gigabit networks? The fastest I've moved data on this is 700 megabytes a second, and that was the first time I used it. I was just screwing around. I actually haven't had a need to move stuff that fast since then, but um, in theory, we can actually do this. So, massive data, moving it around. Okay, so we can generate massive amounts of data. We have a cluster. We have, we have something like Flux where we can rent CPUs by the month. That's the way it works. No longer have to buy machines. You actually just say, I want six cores for six months. And then, okay, here you go. Um, we can, so we can, we can run massive problems. We can run stats and we can get all this output. So we've got all this data. And it lives on these big disk systems. And the only way we can reasonably move them is on these massive networks. And we have our usual tools. We have MATLAB. We have R. We have um, IDL. We have ArcGIS. We have all these different tools that are really focused to live on a single machine. So like, the machines we build on the Flux, they have 48 gigs of RAM. Well, okay, this output is you know, one four times that. How do I actually manipulate this? Uh, that's what I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about. So, visit. There's a number of things that are nice about visit. One, it comes from a national lab, Lawrence Livermore. Um, so it's free, you can just download it. 
It's cross-platform. I'm going to be running it on a Mac and a Linux machine simultaneously. And there's also, I've also used that on Windows. It comes in two pieces. There's the viewer, which is what you'll see here, and then there's an engine. And the engine is designed to run on these high-performance clusters. So what's going to happen is that data that I showed, the 200 gig files, that's going to stay on that big disk system on this big multi-million dollar computer NICS. It's going to do all the work and it's going to send the results back to me, but I can rotate it, manipulate it, save images, generate movies, whatever I want. So you can, when you download Visit, yes, you can just run it on your machine. If you download the Mac version, you can even run it on the multiple cores on your machine because they build it with MPI support. You, know, you, you can run this on your desktop. Um, if I look at another image, I'm sorry, I really need to put these in a better place than my Facebook page. Um, like this image here, this is a tile display that's up in the 3D lab in the Deuterstadt Center. This is actually funded by Provost Office. Anybody can use this. Even though it's in the, Duke, the Art, Architecture, and Engineering Library, that's a Provost building. It's a library like anywhere else. Anybody can come and use this tile display. This tile display is four times HD resolution. It's called 4K display. Um, this basically goes, that's me sitting in front of it, from the floor to the ceiling in that room. This is Visit running on front of it, and this is a small data set. It runs right on the machine. This is a CGNS file. It's just a bunch of information from a CFD, computational fluid dynamics, around an airplane. Um, but this could be anything. Uh, we can put protein ba data bank files in there. We can put network graphs in there. So if we're just looking at like social connections, we have census data and we want to just draw a bunch of lines and circles around things to say, like, these are what's correlated. These are the similar things. You can do all that here. And they have all their usual 3D modeling stuff, Maya, and things on there, too. It doesn't have to be on a big tile display. I'll show you. I'll do it on my laptop. Or I can just write on one of these big national resources. So where I go too far, before I forget I have these in my hand, I have a stack of cards here. If you want one, feel free to take one. Um, my office is just in the Deuterstadt Center, so I'll well, we get you in contact with the people who help your specific department. But again, we operate all these resources. I also, um, anybody here ever heard of TerraGrid or Exceed? Okay. TerraGrid and its follow on, because the TerraGrid grant ended and its follow on called Exceed, is um, a set of national cyber infrastructure resources that were put together by the National Science Foundation. These are display walls, experts data storage, um, data analysis, big tiles, but small ones much bigger than this one, like ones that will, like fill this entire wall. Um, you can get access to all those things. And all you have to do is submit a small proposal. So there's no cost besides having to make a proposal. Uh, startup allocations give you 200,000 CPU hours. Not bad for only an abstract. And that's per science. So if you have two different projects going, you get two different startups. So it's actually awarded not to individuals, it's awarded to the group doing the work and then you assign users to it. And then you can get actually multi-million dollar hours. When we have issues like um, a single flux node only has 48 gigs of RAM, well we have multiples of those. If my application actually needs more than 48 and it's not what we call distributed memory parallel, we need a machine with even more RAM in a single box. So we have many boxes with 48. If you need more than one box, we don't have that right now. We send them to like a machine like the one I'm going to use called Nautilus, which is available under <coughs> an Exceed allocation. And that's actually how I have access to it. Remote Data Access Analysis and Visualization Center, National Center. This is a machine. Um, a machine like this would cost millions, and it would cost millions a year to operate. But they give away time on it for free. Uh, how big is it? Uh, well, it's a single computer, so it's not a cluster. It's a single computer. A single computer with 427 terabytes of a parallel file system. That's what I showed before. Um, 1,024 cores. So it's like, hey man, we got these machines on Flux. They have 12 cores, and the new ones, they have 16. This has 1,024. We can't touch this. Um, and then how much total RAM? Uh, they should have, oh yeah, four terabytes of RAM. So we go from 48 gigs to four terabytes. I'm actually going to use like 256 if I'm going to use for this job. So we can get you access to machines like this for data analysis. 
So it used to be we were working with engineers, that's, that's where I come from, that's who I work with the most, but again, that's not what we're limited to, it's just what my experience is mostly. They used to have to like take these 200 gig data sets, cut a chunk out of it, make an image, cut a chunk out of the next one, read that down, do something, and then Photoshop it back together, literally Photoshop it back together, um, so you can see what's going on. Yeah, it's a lot nicer just to do it. <laughs> Do it all at once, rotate it, you know, you can, you can make derived variables inside of visit. So it, as long as it understands your file format, it'll read it in. And then you can make these arbitrary data types. You can actually just say, you know, make the average of some sequence of numbers and that's a new variable that you can plot. Free, visit is scalable. How scalable? The largest visit run that I'm aware of, and this is actually a little old now, they have a dedicated Viz cluster for visit at Lawrence Livermore. 18,000 CPU cores, 8 trillion cells in this mesh. It's a supernova simulation. It was a static image, it wasn't dynamic data over time, but 8 trillion cells. It scales very, very well. It requires special equipment to do this. Guess what? We have that special equipment on Flux. So you can use that locally if you want to use Flux. Or you can get access to something like this. Or literally any other machine that's on Exceed. Um, because I am the, I'm part of this NSF project through a program called the Campus Champions Program, I can get you on any of these Exceed Terrigrid machines. If you have trouble with them, I can help you. I have logins on all of them. I have back channel access to all the support people. So when you look at using these national resources. How big do they get? Okay, if the visualization box they provide is a thousand cores and four terabytes of RAM, you can only think how big the computational resources get. The biggest one is Kraken. I believe it's the eighth most powerful publicly acknowledged supercomputer in the world, but it's a couple years old now. Um, they have new ones going in. It's over 100,000 CPUs in a single cray. It's quite the beast of a machine. So generate massive quantities of data. Now what's it actually look like trying to manipulate these massive quantities of data without having to copy it all around the world? So we're going to leave this. This machine lives in Tennessee. And so I start a visit. So this is what a visit looks like when you start it up. Actually, let me go ahead and mirror the displays. It kind of has two pieces. It has a viewer window, and then there's actually like a file and plot window. You can have multiple viewer windows, that's how it's marked window one. You can actually have multiples of them, and you can lock them to each other, both in time and in position. So they have the same set of data. You want to have two different plots side by side, but make sure they're always on the same time step, and then like if you rotate one, the other one rotates two. You can do that also. One thing I will warn you about this is, because of the nature of we're going over these networks and we're doing massive data sets, it's not going to be like nice and smooth, like I can just rotate this thing willy-nilly. You'll rotate it, and there'll be a little bit of time for it to update. Um, so it's you know, there, there are some niceties that you give up by using a tool like this. If it's a small enough data set and you're running it locally, you just flip it all around all you want. So, we actually open a file. Opening file gets interesting though. Notice it asks for a host. This is how I say, hey, I want to open a file on Nautilus. I've already installed something called a host profile. That's something that's a little involved, I'm not going to cover that here. If you're looking at, if there's not a host profile already available for the machine you're using, come talk to us and we can help you set that up. Uh, basically what it describes is, okay, when I say Nautilus, where, where is Nautilus? What's Nautilus's actual address? And um, these large systems always go through like a batch system where you submit work to it, and you say how many CPUs, it describes how to do that. But in this case, all I'm going to do is, I'm going to say that I want to connect to Nautilus. And it's going to ask me for my password. It's going to start up a little something. I hope it's already started before I can do anything. 
But now I've noticed a file path, nics slash b slash home slash rockp. I'm now actually browsing files on the remote computer in Tennessee. So I didn't have to move anything. So I'm going to actually move to the uh, also files that is on my data list. So I've got this work output. So one thing is, Visit does have to understand your data. It's very easy to actually write a plugin for it to describe your data to it, but there's actually a lot of standard formats. I could give a whole other talk about standard file formats for different disciplines, both in engineering and other fields. Um, you'll see a lot of them here, but uh, yeah, I, won't, I won't bore you with so much more stuff. Uh, okay, where is it? Oh, wait a minute. WordFrights and NetCDF, which is a standard scientific format that's heavily used by people in the weather sciences. And so that's why I'm not seeing it. Okay, I'm going right over there. Okay, so I say open. And I'm going to say I want three hours and 16 cores. Nah, let's, let's grab 32 CPUs. And so now what's happening is. It's actually submitted a job to this big supercomputer for me. Um, luckily enough, normally Nautilus has space on it because it is just supposed to be an analysis machine. Some of the big, you know, like actual, like long-running compute machines, you know, there's an actual queue where you have to wait. Uh, so once this starts, we'll actually be able to start doing things. But once it started, it's actually running on the 32 CPUs that were assigned to me. Um, okay, so there it starts. So now that it's actually started, I can actually start looking at data. So I've opened, I've opened that file, and I can see all these different time steps in there. Um, I can actually open multiple files, and notice even in the files that I have open, it has a host name there. I can actually have a single visit viewer connect to multiple machines. So I could have data living here at NICS, and maybe I've got been given access to some collaborator's data who's actually an NCAR the National Center for Atmospheric Research. You know, same kind of data, we're doing similar things, but you know, our data lives in two different places, it's so big, we've got access to both machines, why bother moving it? I'll plot this one on NICS, and I'll plot this little overlay image locally, and I'll plot this one from NCAR's machine, and I'll overlay them all on top of each other, all in one thing. So you can actually just avoid moving these massive points of data, time step. And we say, what kind of plot do we want? They have volume plot for 3D data, vectors, working with vector data. Uh, streamlines. Streamlines are always make pretty pictures, so they can be a little bare to work with initially. Uh, they just basically are a stream that follows a vector field, so they twist and you know, manipulate around. Pseudo color, uh, to go both 3D and 2D data. Uh, that's actually, a lot of times when you have 3D data, you think you need to use volume, but if you're actually only looking at the surface or taking a slice, you actually want true color to be a lot faster. Scatter plots, spreadsheet, you could actually just take a subset of your data and just literally look at the values. Uh, molecules for things like that. Oh, you could just have a mesh, actually. Let's do that. Let's just look at the mesh for this thing. So you can see this is a relatively large mesh. And we just hit draw. So now it's doing its thing, the reading engine output, and wow, okay, it's a big black blob. Why? The data are so large, and there's so many cells in this thing. I can't resolve individual lines on the screen in the mesh. It's trying to draw these little cues, but they're so close together to be able to fit into this thing. The resolution of this display cannot resolve it. That's where these big tile displays, that, that 4 times HD display comes in. You can actually take this, blow it up, see the whole thing, and you can start to resolve the fine detail. Because even a computer screen is made up of little dots, right? It's an approximation. If you have a bunch of data in a spot, but it's got to show it in one pixel. It's an approximation of all that data in that little square. So if I actually go and just zoom in that little bit, that's what it actually is. You just couldn't see it before. So let's actually get rid of that. Normally, mesh, I mean, they're nice to look at for debugging stuff, but you know, they actually aren't all that interesting. Let's do an actual volume plot. Sorry, there's a bug on this version. The 
be this is the 3D rain distribution. So this has a lot more going on into it, and it's and it's a volume plot. So it's going to take a lot longer because we're no longer just saying, oh, what's what's the regular space on? I got to read values. I got to interpolate stuff. I got to do this first. And I've got to zoom this back up. When I work with this, um, so I'll show you something about this in a moment. But when I work with this kind of tool, I'll tell you one of the best investments I ever made is this thing right here. This is a little tool that's sold by Matrox. There's other manufacturers that make similar things. This plugs three displays into one display input. Best thousand dollars I ever spent. I mean, it's for the three computer displays plus this. Being able to use four displays so I can look at multiple pieces of data, my documentation, as well as the data simultaneously instead of flipping through windows. Like I'm getting frustrated right now with just this. Trying to flip between two things. If I want to have two plots side by side of both rain and snow, I would just be wanting to punch myself. On the other hand, when I use this thing, really, really nice. It, productivity, everything. Great cool. What is the most expensive thing you're always working with? We're talking about multi-million dollar computers and everything else, but I'm going to use it for a fraction of the time. What is the most expensive thing when working with anything? It's always the people involved. So if you can do anything to increase the productivity of your people, great. So this is actually a volume plot. Um, I am going to show one thing though. This is actually the default type of volume uh, plot called splattering. It's an approximation. It's, it's relatively fast, but because I have 32 CPUs on a really fast computer, I'm actually going to use ray tracing. So I'm taking a 200 um, gigabyte input set, and I have enough CPU horsepower behind it that I can actually use ray trace. This is how you make publication quality images. Great. You know how normally long this would normally take me? The whole thing partitioned up, it's going in parallel, it's got tons of memory, it doesn't have to use disk, it's just all the data is there as quickly as possible. Look at this, this is great. I can go and I can rotate it and everything else. And it's going to redo its thing and you can't see much at that kind of angle. Um, you'll notice something interesting here that I'm going to demonstrate in other ways. So, you can have multiple plots, like I can just keep defining them inside this window so I can lay, you know, I could, I could lay the snow and rain on top of each other at the same time. Um, but then there's these things called operators. So notice how this is, this is really thin. Because this is actually, let me see if I can remember which plot it was. There's, yeah, I really don't remember which data set it was inside of this thing. Um, th there's one that shows, and actually the entire left half over here, you would see Florida all the way up to Massachusetts and down to the northern part of South America. So this represents a very large spatial area. So it's very large this way, but this is still 10 kilometers the thickness. Um, so what we can do is we can actually use an operator. And so operators, interesting, they work on an existing plot. So you can take like a chunk of it, you know, say I want to take like a spherical chunk out of something. Slice an ISO surface, you know, maybe I want it to see constant values. Um, transformations is actually the one I'm going to be interested in. Which is, I'm going to transform the data. So if I expand this, see I've got my transform operator, you just keep, you make a pipeline. You just have manipulation on manipulation on data. Get your out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scale into Z 10 times. Apply, say draw. And see now I can see kind of what's going on. So this is the idea. I am in close to real time manipulating a data set that if I just wanted to download it onto campus, I do it overnight. Even with Clovis, I say transfer it and I wait in the morning, I've got an email saying it's done. I can just work with it. Don't bother moving it. Leave, leave it on these massive machines, these national, you know, these national infrastructure things. Just 
leave it there. And try to withdraw all the meaning you can. This tool is capable of so much more than I know what to even do with it. There's a public mailing list that you can find off the Visit website. There's also a wiki called visitusers.org that has lots and lots of good information. It's open source. You can download the whole thing, manipulate it, say you want to add a new model. There's a lot of research going into scalable visualization techniques. Or if you want to add ways to read and write different data formats. What I didn't show, I mentioned earlier, is it has the ability to make derived data types. Say I have three variables. Um, and I want to take them together to make like a, a derived vector variable out of it, you can actually do that. Um, you can do these, what's called expressions. So you want to just take something and kind of get the average of a series of numbers, you can do that. There's a whole library of functions you can actually manipulate. So you can actually use this tool almost like a computational tool. Um, it's scriptable. There's a Python and a Java scripting interface. So you can actually take a whole sequence of stuff and just let it do its thing. Um, in fact, that's how it does uh, videos. You can um, yeah, export database. But you can do save movie. And so do a new simple movie. You just pick the type, the window size. So even though your display here might be limited to a certain size, you may want to crank up the resolution for passing someone with a big tile display or for some sort of high resolution. You just want to save an image that you can just save on your desktop and open up when you want to. Um, you can actually just save a movie. And you can s you set multiple types. So notice there's also stereo. Down into 3D lab, they have this nice stereo display where they've got these two projectors, put them through polarized filters, so you can get 3D. They also have one of these, um, oh, I forget what they call it, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's basically projectors on um, four sides of your ceiling, left, right, and front. You actually walk inside there with stereo glasses and a remote control, and it tracks your head movement so the perspective is always right, and you can literally walk inside your data. Yeah. And so this is how you save a stereo movie. So you can save a stereo movie and a non-stereo movie all at the same time. You set up what you want, say go, and it just submits it to the batch cluster and sister and chunks away, generates your movie, you get an MPEG back. So I actually have one that I made earlier that I should have redone. So this is actually just the exact same set of data we're looking at, except it over time. This process, once I had it in the variable I wanted and all set up, and I just fill in that little simple movie thing, say how big I want it to be, uh, what time set to start on, how many time steps to skip, how many time steps per second for the like, frame rate. Once I did that, I just say go. This whole process took me like 20 minutes from beginning to end video in my hand. 